I have been visiting here for the past uh, couple of days. I'll be here for a couple of more days. I'm glad at the opportunity to uh, present a lecture on data mining versus data assimilation. I think Dr. Endam told me that it could be an appropriate topic for this uh, 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 summer series. So I'm going to overview what is data mining. I'm going to argue that data mining is one of the oldest of the disciplines. Data mining began with science. Some of the examples of data mining, instead of trying to define what data mining is, I'm going to tell what are the activities when we look back, we can now say in the modern lingo, we would have called it as an exercise in data mining. So much of what we know in physical sciences had their origins in astronomy. In astronomy, they had everything based on observations. Thanks to the Herculean efforts of Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, these are only a small sampling of a long list of pioneers in this area. And much of what they did was to be able to uh, uh, summarize the essence and the contents of the observation, which we now take it for granted, and that also laid the foundations of the modern science. The heliocentric system, the, the gravity acts on body at the same rate irrespective of the mass. With the Kepler's loss that the planets revolve around the sun, with sun as one of the foci, in equal areas, uh, in equal time, equal areas are swept by, and the Newton's loss. The story goes that uh, Newton was lying under the apple tree one fine spring morning, uh, spring afternoon. The apple came down. He thought, why did it come down instead of going up? And he invented gravity. Well, that's a beautiful story for first graders. But then Newton had the benefit of the work of Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler. And uh, he, with his ingenuity, was able to formulate the law of gravitation as we now know today. So these are some of the earliest of the examples in physical sciences that are the fruits of the labor coming out of mining data. And I would like to argue that every data is the big data of its time. We, we, we make it, in computer science, I'm, I'm a computer scientist, we make a big deal out of big data. Yeah, the data is bigger. But to Kepler, the amount of data that he had at that time was big. It took 10 years for him to analyze the data. He didn't have a pencil. He didn't have a paper as we talk about. They, all they had was telescopes. That very meticulously uh, um, 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 recorded the observations. Of course, today we have teraflop machines, computers that can store teraflop bytes. We better tackle teraflop terabyte problems. So, in 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 one sense, the problem got bigger with the ever increasing computing power, and that's what I'm going to relate to in a minute. So observations were collected over the decades, meticulously analyzed by hand to formulate the laws of nature. Example, heliocentric system, four laws of Kepler, laws of gravitation, and the three Newton's laws. Within the context of physical sciences, these are some of the earliest examples of data mining. Note, in chemical, biological, and other sciences, there were instances such as the above that are replete with historical facts that can illustrate the role that data mining has played in the development of science and all its branches. So what is data mining? Data mining is a process of extracting the structure or the patterns that are inherent in the data or the observations. So that's the idea. Kepler was able to uncover the four laws of Kepler by his ingenuity and looking at the patterns. So these patterns provide clues to the data generating process. I want to know, um, 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 well, it is Kepler's law. The Kepler's laws essentially captured the motions of the planet. So by simulating the Kepler's laws, I can reproduce the observations that they made prior to him. It is this ability to uncover the data generating process that we call model. Is the discovery of these models is the ultimate goal of data mining. 
So the ultimate goal of data mining is to understand and quantify the data generating process. Since the motion of the celestial objects inherently followed certain laws, early pioneers with their hard work and ingenuity could discover laws that laid the foundations of physical sciences and engineering as we now know today. Of course, the research in data mining continues, unabated. Now, let's uh, fast forward to modern times. Abundance of data, revival of data mining. So volume of data collected doubles in every two to three years. Thanks to the technology of computers, large scale storage devices, communication and sensor technologies. I, we can measure anything. We can send anything from anywhere to anywhere. I can store volumes of data. It is this ability to collect data. We, are, we have data in abundance. Just to be able to give an example, 50 years ago in medical science, there was no disease called hepatitis. Then the measurement technology improved. They were able to discriminate the structure of the chemistry of blood. Then they said that that's a disease called hepatitis. 10 years later, they said, no, no, there's not one hepatitis, hepatitis A and B. Now they say hepatitis A, B and C. Do we know all of it? We still don't know. That could be a D very soon. So as the measurement technology improves, as our ability to observe improves, data, new sets of data are collected. As new sets of data are collected, we mine that new set of data to be able to infer newer processes that are already in existence, just we didn't know. That's the, that's the fundamentals of data mining as I, as I see it. So today, interest in data mining include physical, biological, medical, space exploration, all branches of engineering, ecology, economics, social science, sports, recreation, governments, private companies, just about anything and everything. Just about anything and everything. We will come back to data mining a bit later. I want to go back to the early days of astronomy to pull another string. The title of my talk is Data Mining and Data Assimilation. I'm going to talk about the complementary nature of these two uh, disciplines. <coughs> so introduction of the mathematical models by combining concurrent developments in physical laws led to the Newton's laws. So Newton had this idea but he didn't have mathematical tools. So he, along with Leibniz, invented calculus. Necessity is the mother of invention. He introduced the notion of differential equation. So calculus, differential equation, these were tools that resulted from the need to be able to express the laws that govern the motions of planets around the sun. So that naturally led to the development of dynamic models to describe the motions of planets around the sun. With availability of the model, the potential for forecast became a reality. Today we can predict the lunar and solar eclipse for the next 100 years absolutely precisely. I don't know how many of you noticed this. Yesterday night there was a lunar eclipse. A month ago in the North America, we had observed a full solar eclipse. So we can predict lunar and solar eclipses, which is a, a function of the motions, the relative uh, positions of planets to the sun, absolutely precisely. Thanks to Newton, thanks to dynamic laws. The laws were derived out of data mining and they developed the tools to be able to solve the models. The solution of the model becomes the prediction. If I know the position of the moon with respect to the sun and the earth yesterday, I can predict where it's going to be today. That's the idea of prediction. So prediction was made possible by the availability of models. In this case, the models are dynamic because everything is in moving, everything in motion. Now I would like to talk about another strand. We talked about Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton. Gauss is another luminary. He was just 24 years old. He got into this um, uh, 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 scientific inquiry. He was facing a very challenging problem. They were looking at a planetoid called Ceres. The observation folks said, well, it went somewhere. I don't know where it went. So what the problem? Where did it go? Where it will appear? When will it appear? And what bearing? That became an, an open problem, pressing open problem of his time. But Gauss had 
the benefit of the models that Newton, Kepler all have developed. So Gauss knew that this planetoid were in this position at this point, at this position at this point. So he wanted to fit an ellipse to the motion of the planetoid. And you all know uh, um, ellipses are second order polynomials in xy. It's a two variable, second order polynomial two variables. So there is an x square term, xy term, y square term, x term, y term, and a constant term. So there are six. We know every ellipse needs to have six parameters. I want to be able to estimate those six parameters because I want to know the particular ellipse that describes the motion of this particular planetoid. But there is a data. So he brought the data and the model together to be able to estimate the unknown parameters and he discovered the notion of least squares as we know today. So the method of least squares were invented by Gauss to be able to fit a model to the, uh, to fit the orbit of the planetoid. Once he fitted a model, he was able to use that model to be able to predict. Lo and behold, his predictions were totally correct. And he was essentially 24 years old. He changed the way in which people looked at prediction. So this aspect of being able to combine a model, a generic model with data to be able to obtain the estimates of the unknown to get a specialized model for the specialized problem, that aspect is called data simulation. Models, data mining, model, data, data simulation. So by combining the model of the observation in the least square sense, Gauss estimated the unknown parameters, create the first assimilated model ever known to mankind. He then used this assimilated model to accurately predict the time and the location of the reappearance of the last astronomical object. That is the first success story. So this work was responsible for the development of least squares as we know today. Least squares method is a workhorse of statistics, one of the major tools and techniques in estimation theory. The method of least squares still continues to dominate the theory and practice of estimation of unknown parameters in all walks of life. By this time, Gauss also had invented something else. In those days, the observations were uh, marked by humans and they were based on simple telescopes. So humans had committed errors. If you are, if you are a running car, if there is a needle, you would, re, you would read the speed of 62, I may read it at 59. Observations have errors in them. So he recognized that these observations are inherently erroneous. There's a random noise that is affecting all the observations. So he wanted to be able to analyze the goodness of the observation, quality of observation. Within that context, he tried to analyze the distribution of the observation errors. He invented the notion of a bell curve that we now take it for granted, it's called the Gaussian distribution. So he essentially discovered the notion of bell curve. So today we take it for granted that all the observation, you cannot make anything without, you cannot observe anything without error. The errors in the observations are Gaussian distributed, bell-shaped curve. So he invented least squares, he invented the bell-shaped curve. The bell-shaped curve is called the Gaussian distribution. As I'm, I'm sure many of you may have come across in basic probability theory. So what is data simulation? Data simulation is a fusion of model with, with data. Models in general are descriptions of underlying physical processes. A model doesn't refer to one quantity, it refers to a uh, 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 million instances, uncountable in instances. For example, if I say a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c, a, b, c are real. If I say 3x squared minus 42x plus 17, that's a particular instance. So model, an instant, you particularize the model by specializing the parameters. So to be able to uh, uh, specialize the model, uh, uh, we need to be able to estimate the, the, the parameters. So model represents a class suitably parametrized. So examples of this data simulation now in modern lingo is called uh, 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 static regression, regression analysis and statistics. Dynamic models, so if I have a dynamic model, I, I know the solutions at certain point in time. I don't know where the solution must have come from. I don't know the initial condition. Trying to estimate the initial condition from your finite samples of the, of the observations. 
of the model output, that's also uh, uh, a problem of great interest in data simulation. So data observation, so data or observation reveal the secrets or the underlying truth of nature. Model tries to capture this underlying truth. And going from data to model is data mining. And trying to estimate the parameters of the model using the very same data. So data is used multiple ways. One, to be able to write the model. And then to be able to estimate the parameters of the very model that the data gave rise to. So I use data in two modes. So by combining models with data, estimating the unknown parameters of the model using the very same data, we get the specialized instantiation of the model called a simulated model. So an assimilated model is a particular model which is meant for a particular uh, 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 application and it is contingent on the data that is used. This assimilated model is a good tool for creating forecast or prediction. One of the standard tools for the fusion of models with data is based on the method of least squares. So the discipline of data assimilation primarily deals with the development of methods for assimilating models with data. So data assimilation is an area which is quite algorithmic in nature. I have model, I have data. I would like to be able to combine the two. What is the best way to be able to estimate the parameters of the model from the given data? This problem arises again and again in different works of life. So the goal of data assimilation is to generate forecast. Now forecast is the fundamental problem of great interest in life. I want to be able to forecast the moment of a hurricane, which we call typhoon around here. Tornado is another aspect of severe weather. So what do we do? Uh, 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 fluid mechanics people have created beautiful models for the motion of a hurricane, but no two hurricanes are alike. So I have a general partial differential equation that describes the motion of a hurricane. So what is a hurricane? A hurricane is a whirlpool. So it has a circular motion and the whole body moves. I'm sure you must have seen that. So what is the wind speed? What is the lateral speed? Which direction is moving? How much rain does it con contain? Very little uh, landfall. These are all the questions of interest and prediction. <coughs> and that is done routinely by us. Uh, so what do they do? They fly planes into that particular hurricane, collect data, come to the forecast office, and they combine the general models with this data and use this. This may hit near Vishakapatnam. This may come to a commercial near Pondicherry or it may go to Bangladesh coast. So that kind of a forecast is generated largely using data simulation. <laughs> um, there are other aspects of data simulation examples I would like to give. A crime scene investigation. There is a crime happened. Police comes and collects information. They would like to be able to, they would like to be able to build a model who may have committed the crime, what kind of technology they used, so on and so forth. So crime scene investigation is an example of a detective work. It's an example of a data mining. NTSB, that's called National Transportation Safety Agency, is a big agency in the United States. What is their role? If there is a train accident, is a bus accident, or, or, or a plane accident, they come and cordon off the area, they collect the data, they try to re recreate to be able to assess what may have happened. Is it a human error? Is it a machine error? Is it a design error? So on and so forth. That's a detective work. That's a data mining work. And I would like to, uh, with you, a couple of other examples too. Every government, state, local, uh, national level, we all need to be able to make fire plans, so on and so forth. So how much money I'm going to be able to allocate to education, to road, to crime prevention, so on and so forth. That depends on the estimate of the revenues. So there are good economists within the government system whose only job is to be able to estimate the revenue that may come into their shekar during the course of this year, based on their estimate, the ministers in charge, they try to allocate the budget and develop the budget, allocate the money. For that, you need prediction of the potential revenue for the next year. To me, every medical diagnosis is a, is a, is a, is a data mining problem. You go to the doctor, you sit in the chair, the doctor starts conversing with you. As you talk, he tries to pin down, he tries to eliminate. He knows what an absolutely perfectly human body should be. And he's hearing from you the, 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 the complaints. And then he has narrowed on, I want a blood test. I want an x-ray. I want a CAT scan. 
I want to test your stomach. I want to do this. I want to do that to be able to further diagnose. So what does he do? Collecting the data from you, he is able to model your status to be able to cure the problem that you are suffering from. So data mining occurs in every walk of life, medical diagnosis to generating budget priorities, to generating uh, understanding the cause of failure, to detect your work. You can see the, the, the prevalence of data mining in life. Um, now, to be able to look at it from a mathematical perspective, uh, in mathematics, we would like to classify problems into two types. One is called a direct problem, another is called the inverse problem. So, to further understand the difference between and the relation between data mining and data simulation, I would like to introduce two classifications, direct problem. What is an example of a direct problem? Suppose I have a polynomial, I want to evaluate the polynomial x is equal to 10, that's a direct problem. Suppose I have a differential equation in initial condition, I want to find the solution, that's a direct problem. Given a matrix and a vector, if I want to compute A times X to get B, that's a direct problem. When you are in college, you always learn to solve direct problems. But when you go out to work, you always called upon to solve the inverse problem. Of course, they are also introduced to solving inverse problem when you are in college. So what are the examples of inverse problems, typical inverse problem? Given a polynomial, how do you, how do you find, solve for the roots? I want to be able to factor the polynomial. Given a differential equation and a particular solution, I want to find the initial condition that should have led to that solution. Given a matrix A and a vector B, I want to be able to solve the linear system x is equal to A inverse B. These are, these are examples of inverse problems. It turns out that data mining and data assimilation as a class of problems, they are inherently inverse problems. They are inherently inverse problem and two of the two inverse problems prediction is a direct problem if i have a model i can predict you pull the model forward but to be able to create the model from data that's an inverse problem given a given chosen given a chosen model and the observation to be able to estimate the parameters of the model that's an inverse problem so data mining data assimilation mathematically speaking in uh, uh, involves solving inverse problems once the model is available Pulling the model in, uh, forward, that's a uh, uh, that, uh, uh, direct problem. So at the highest level, data mining relates to solving the important class of inverse problems leading to the discovery of the basic laws or models implied by the data. Think of Kepler. So to me, who is a model, um, 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 what do I think of? When you, when you do data mining, you are doing the job of Kepler. When you do estimation, you are doing the job of Gauss. When you do prediction, you are also doing the job of Gauss. You are trying to pull the model forward in time. So, discovery of models from data, that's an inverse problem. That's what data mining is all about. So, examples of discovery of laws from, um, 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 uh, from data include basic laws in astronomy, Kepler-Newton, atom models in the early 1900s, the theory of evolution by Darwin, based on essentially an observation. Building models to identify credit card fraud, this is one of the problems in computer science in modern times. A bank wants to, you make an application for a credit card, the bank asks you to fill a profile, based on your profile, somebody does analysis, yes, he's a good person. No, he had had problems in the past. I may give you a credit card, because of the inherent risk in you, I may have to charge you 5% more interest. They still want your money. Arithmetic, please? That's right. So credit card identification. Uh, um, based on the observed structure of the autocorrelation and time series, we try to decide the class of models that might capture the behavior of time series. In time series analysis, model building, data simulation, all mingled together in one. So data mining is what is inherent in time series um, um, applications. So data mining has been and still continues to be the basis for the advancement of knowledge in all of sciences and engineering. We didn't call it data mining. In computer science, uh, um, data mining is a big topic in the past couple of decades, a couple of decades. Even though they didn't call it data mining, that's exactly what they were doing. That's exactly what they were, they were trying to do. Uh, at the second level of the inverse problem is the core of data simulation. Assume that we 
have a newly discovered mathematical laws expressed in the form of a mathematical model. The problem now becomes one of data simulation that relates to solving the second level of inverse problem that deals with the estimation of the unknown parameters of the model using the very same or similar data. Determination of the, how many of you are aware of uh, neural network, head of neural network? Determination of the weights in the neural network is a, it's a, it's an estimation problem. It's a data simulation problem. So you can, you, uh, you have concrete examples from your own experience. So what is that? I would like to be able to tune the weight such that I minimize the classification error. Estimate the sea surface temperature. I want to talk about this now yeah, for, for a few minutes. At the University of Oklahoma, we have a very big meteorological operations. Much of the weather that happens depends on the amount of water vapor that gets evaporated from sea surface. There are lots of oceans, but Pacific Ocean is, is one of the largest of the oceans. It has tens of thousands of square miles of sea surface. The amount of water vapor that puts out essentially controls the behavior of rain in many parts of the world. If the sea surface temperature goes above by one degree, we call them El Nino phenomena. If it comes down, we call it La Nina phenomena. The temperature of the sea surface never is constant. It always oscillates. Water takes long time to heat. It also takes long time to cool. So when it is above, it's one, one, one kind of problem. When it is below, it's another kind of problem from the average. So how do I determine the sea surface temperature over 10,000 square miles of area in equatorial Pacific? Basic laws of physics. Any hot body radiates. I'm going to observe the radiant energy from satellite. So based on the infrared energy I receive in the satellite, I have to do an inverse problem of temperature. If I know the temperature, I can tell you how much energy is put out. But if I know the energy, if I know the sea surface properties, physical properties, I want to be able to estimate the temperature of the sea surface that led to this much energy. That's an inverse problem. Estimating the amount of rain in a cloud system using a radar. That's going to be 10 inch rain in the next 24 hours. That's going to be half an inch rain in the next two days. I need to be able to estimate because I need to make a, 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 a forecast for public consumption. Um, then estimate the structure of the earth. For example, we all take the gravity to be constant in, our, in all of our calculations, 90, 984 centimeter per second square, something like that, right? But if you, if you, if you really look at it, the microgravity changes. And what, what is the reason for the changes? If there is granite below, it is more. If the loose sand is less. So on an average, if you try to measure the gravity, the gravity changes. That's called anomaly. Geologists, by measuring and mapping the gravitation and anomaly, could then predict what is behind. And why is this important? We want to extract gold. We want to extract mica. We want to extract copper. We want aluminum. We want all precious metals. We want petrol. So how do they estimate that there is petrol here? How do they estimate there is gold here? All of it may. Hey, that's inverse problem. That's it. So you can see the prevalence and the importance of um, 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 uh, uh, inverse problems in the geophysical explorations, geophysical exploration world. So what is the, what is the third level? The third level is a direct problem. So once an assimilated model is made available, interest then shifts to the direct problem of generating a short term forecast. Why do we do all the things? I want to know how tomorrow is going to look like. I want to know what is going to be the IBM stock price tomorrow. I want to know how much, how, how, uh, how hot the temperature in Bangalore is going to be. Why? Power companies want to know if the temperature goes by two degrees, the consumption for electricity to cool the air conditioning goes up. I cannot flip a switch and generate electricity. Electricity is generated from hydropower plant or thermal power plant. Of course, these days we have solar, wind and other energy forms too. If you have a, hydro, if you have a thermal plant, hydro generation, there's not much you can do. The water flow is resulted by nature. Thermal power plant, I can control. But to be able to bring a thermal power plant from coal to the production level, it takes three days to prime them. Why? I have to heat the water, the steam is generated, steam has to be superheated at a certain pressure before it can run the turbine. 
So I cannot meet the demand if the temperature for tomorrow goes up by 5 degrees and the, temp and, and the demand for electricity goes up by 25% today. I need forecast three days ago, four days ago. So every electric company, every responsible electric company, they have a team working with meteorologists trying to forecast what is going to be the distribution of maximum temperature in a given area so that they can plan the production schedule for electricity. So now what is the problem of interest to us in modern day? How the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is going to rise by 2025? They used to call it 2020. 2020 is tomorrow, right? So we always keep pushing the boundaries. We talk about 2025, 2050. How much carbon dioxide is going to get accumulated? How much heat is going to get trapped? What is going to be the resulting rise in temperature? Hey, these are predictions. So if you look at the international body, the, the, by 2050, the temperature rise is going to be anywhere from, in some predictions, is 2 degrees, and some predictions, I say, 6 and a half degrees. If it is going to be, I hope the 6 and a half degrees is false. I hope it doesn't come through. Why? The average temperature of the globe rises by 6 and a half degrees. We'll all be scorched. There won't be cities like Med probably Madras or Miami. Much part, good part of Madras could be, or, or, or Mangalore could be in water because sea level is going to rise. The, 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 uh, the polar ice is going to melt. Polar is already melting. Polar ice is melting. Um, uh, we may also want to be able to um, predict the snowfall in Boston. It's not unusual in Boston. They can have uh, two feet of snow. The, the entire economy comes to a grind halt. Schools still have to be closed. So I need to be able to make a prediction about the amount of snowfall. Of course, I already talked about the revenue by the state treasury. So the need for prediction arises from various direction. We want to be able to predict everything in life. If you look at the, peop the number of people who predict others' futures, I think India tops the per capita. Everywhere there are people who can predict your future, right? That's right. Do they use the model? I'm not trying to criticize, I'm going to make an observation, so please don't take it too seriously. If you, if you, if you want to continue, please do, but I want you to think about that. What's that? What's that? That's right. I understand. I understand. That's right. That's right. But the good, can they, the, 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 the question I'm asking is that, can they, uh, can they tell the quality of prediction? When does it go, doesn't come true? Meteorology, they will say, there is going to be uh, 10, cent, 10 millimeters of rain in, in downtown Bangalore with a probability 80%. If it is probably 80%, you better take an umbrella. If there is going to be a 5 centimeter of, a 5 millimeter of rain in, in downtown Bangalore with a probability 30 degrees, don't worry about it. Are you me? So that the probability of your prediction coming true is what is needed. I can predict anything, right? Or you are going to be a collector day after tomorrow. I can make 10 rupees from you and then go get on with life. Are you with me? So it is not only predicting the level, but predicting the variance associated with the prediction. That's what's important. And that's where you need the model. Your, your observations are well taken. So, 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 so I'm not trying to criticize. I simply want you to ask a question. So prediction means two things. One is level. Another is volatility. Volatility refers to the standard deviation associated with the prediction. And standard deviation is a square, the square root of the variance. So what is the level? What is the variance? How do I believe it? Is it 80%? Is it 40%? Probability. 40% probability of the variance is more. 80% probability of the variance is less. That, 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 that's what I have. So I, there are lots of other things. I don't want to belabor those issues. I'm going to go back to the uh, um, summary. At the first level, data mining seeks to uncover the basic laws that are hidden in the data. These laws are represented by models of some kind with unknown parameters. At the second level, data assimilation deals with the task of fusing data with models to produce assimilated model by estimating the unknown parameters. At the third level, using the given assimilated model, produce various forecast product for public consumption. 
So data mining, data simulation and forecasting are three parts of a continuum, are three parts of a continuum. There are a couple of references. The first book is our book. You can see my name in the middle. Uh, we wrote a book on dynamic data simulation. Look at that. The subtitle is least squares approach. It's well over 250 years least squares are invented. Least squares approach is the uh, unifying theme in our book. Um, it was published in Cambridge University Press. There is another book in time series. It's an excellent book that also deals with data mining and data simulation. Uh, there is a book on data mining with a title, Introduction to Data Mining, by Tang, Steinbach, and Kumar. These are some samplings from the vast literature on data mining, data simulation, and prediction. I'll be delighted to take some questions if you have. Thank you all. Can I? Can okay, I? so John over here said I would like to call Professor Arendra to present Dr. Uh, uh, Professor of Science. Could I have some water? Yeah. One second. Thank you very much. No, yeah, I don't. But I don't want to hold him. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Even though this is given to you, I'm still open for a few minutes. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. I, 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 I have some hearing. Yeah, machine learning is a problem in data mining. Oh, good, 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 good question. That's or some of these things I skipped. Uh, uh, let, let's talk about that now. I have, I have been able to classify data into class A and class B. I could do it. I want the machine to do it. I'm going to build a neural network. I am going to build a clustering algorithm. Clustering algorithm is a kind of a model that tries to emulate the human behavior. What is it we would like to do? Clustering algorithm is one class of model that helps you to classify. Neural network is another class of model that helps you to classify. So what do you do? You give an input. You already know the class. Let the machine process. It gives an output. And I already know what should be the correct one. I look at the error, different squares, and then adapt to that. So training neural network is the heart of data simulation. And, and once more, well, model. What is the model? The neural network is the model. The model has a large number of parameters. How many levels? How many neurons per level? Whom you connect? How many stages? We talk about deep neural networks, right? That's right. That's right. Essentially, the idea is I have weights connecting various stages. I have information about the classes of the input. I want to be able to transfer my knowledge to the network adaptively by training. So every training process, so the choice of the neural network incorporates modeling. The training of the neural network incorporates data simulation. Once the neural network is trained, I'm going to use a new input which the network has not seen, prediction. So you can think of many aspects of machine learning within the context of data mining, data simulation, and prediction. And what differentiates one method to the other method to the other method? The type of model, the type of methods used in the data simulation, that's only different. At a conceptual level, they all fall under one roof. Yeah. Of data assimilation on uh, cognitive neuroscience or uh, maybe updated medicine, which is based on prediction and assistance. Do you think it's ethical uh, for us to build a model on the right data? From it is mathematically challenging to build a model. Right. I don't think I get in. I I know enough about the ethicity to be able to describe the ethical dimension of it. But from a mathematical perspective, sure, bring it on. That's my answer. Yeah, that's an all of artificial intelligence, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, is, uh, is genome modification ethical? I'm not, I'm not you, you may have your own idea, I may have my own idea, but the ethicists may have different ideas. But if you go to your supermarket, every corn you buy is modified. Sure, somebody seconds, somebody seconds it. Tomatoes, 
Okay, tomato, if they are in crazy size, if you want to pack it, there's a lot of gaps. So what do they want? They would like to be able to grow tomatoes such that they are as cubical as possible so that the gap is minimum. How do you do that? That's right. That's right. So what is a large scale uh, long term impact of this? I don't know. So, so the, the, to me, what's interesting is the ability to model, the ability to predict, the ability to be able to explain is what is interesting. There, are, uh, there is a huge emergence of new companies, you know, uh, which are helping people to clone their pets or their dogs. So uh, they are doing it based on data assimilation and the data modeling. I, I, I have not seen results in that direction. Sure, sure. What is the, what is, what is the purpose? Having your pet as it is back when your pet does not exist. That's new to me. Right. Any other comment, questions? If you don't have, thank you all for my patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I will see you then. Yeah. Thank you. I'll see you then. Yeah, thank, sure. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Huh? Oh, I don't want to take it with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to take it with me. I'm sure. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.